Hello everybody, this is Dr. Schoffes uh, speaking and uh, we'll work our way through chapter 15 which is about nuclear magnetic resonance and we abbreviate this as NMR. Um, so in the introductory slides here we see some information I already discussed with you in lecture. Um, so NMR spectroscopy um, is, is probably the most powerful method uh, for gaining structural information. That is not to um, simply cast aside what we learned in IR spectroscopy and mass spectrometry, um, but NMR is definitely very powerful because it can help us uh, making a lot of connections within the structure. So, so here we're talking about um, the interaction between electromagnetic radiation uh, which means light and various nuclei. Okay, um, our focus is going to be uh, first on proton NMR and then on carbon NMR. So those two nuclei uh, are important. I didn't mean to cross that out there because we can analyze uh, the different organic structures. And again, I want to emphasize here that we have powerful information within that spectroscopic method to figure out the connections so we can put together the pieces of a puzzle. Um, protons and neutrons in a nucleus uh, behave as if they were spinning. Um, and what is a requirement for uh, spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, is that you have an odd number um, of protons as well as an odd number of neutrons. And so we see this as we're checking at the numbers here. So here we have uh, 1H, we have 13, another odd number, 15, 19, 31. So these are different nuclei that can be measured by NMR spectroscopy. Our focus is going to be on proton and carbon 13. So the spinning charge in the nucleus creates a magnetic moment. Uh, so and the electronic environment is really important in that the magnetic moment is going to affect um, each component of the structure differently. So because of the magnetic moment, we're now talking about magnetic field. Uh, we can talk about an external field, which comes from the instrument, and an internal magnetic moment, depending on whether you have electronegative atoms attached or electron donating or withdrawing groups that will affect uh, the chemical shift and other aspects. The next slide here shows uh, some graphics for this. So you see here the, the, the north-south direction. Um, this is There's an axis of spin um, and that then creates the magnetic moment and you see these lines drawn here to show uh, how that works. So these magnetic lines of force help us um, understand some of the electronics here. Uh, so the magnetic moment uh, exists perpendicular to the axis of the nuclear spin. But because the nuclear is spinning, that's how we now uh, take advantage of this for this particular um, uh, spectroscopic method. So here, basically, what we want to focus on is um, to uh, make sure uh, we understand um, some of the theoretical background. We're not going to do elaborate calculations with some of the formula in there. But um, when we have uh, the magnetic moments and, and look at how they affect the atoms um, and then how they're being exposed to the external magnetic field, uh, here represented as B0, um, there are two choices as to what um, now that nucleus can do. Uh, it can either align with or against the field. So here you have some illustrations. Um, for example, if we have if we have um, here's our energy, uh, it is possible to have two spin states, an alpha and a beta spin state. Uh, so when energy comes in, it can be lift up to a higher level. Without a magnetic field, they are all pointing in different directions. Once you apply the magnetic field, remember that's your B0, that now means uh, these nuclei are either going to align with the external magnetic field or against it, right? So you now see alpha state is down here, beta state is pointing in the other direction. 
So magnetic fields of the spinning nuclei will either align with or um, the external field or against the field. That is really the important part. Now, if a photon has the right amount of energy, it can be absorbed and cause the spinning proton to flip. And it is that kind of uh, coming back to the original state that can be measured. There's some uh, theoretical aspects to this. But we're going to focus mostly on interpreting spectra and looking how the different components play into this. So the stronger the magnetic field, the greater the energy gap. So there is a proportional uh, correlation between the two. All right, so just in words, the radio waves that represent the energy um, are going to um, change from uh, an alpha to a beta energy transition. Uh, and that very much depends on the electronic environment. And that's why we have to you know, bring back some of the material you learned in, in general chemistry and orgo one about electronic nature. Uh, when the alpha uh, state sp flips back to the beta spin, energy is absorbed and the atoms, atoms are said to have resonance. Um, now, I want to be very careful because I should probably use a different color here. That resonance is very different from the resonance you learned about in Orgo 1, where we're talking about um, a different phenomenon uh, that's actually based on molecular models or molecular orbitals. Uh, for example, in allyl cation, this is something you should be able to do uh, rather easily. Remember that we can draw a resonance form using our curved arrows. We use a resonance arrow. So that is very different compared to the NMR resonance, which means that uh, it's a response of the nucleus to the external magnetic field that it, it, it experiences. Um, so the amount of energy required for a proton to spin flip tells us about its electronic environment and thus the structure of the compound. And so again, we can put the pieces of a puzzle together. How do we acquire a proton NMR? This is just a little bit of um, um, background. Um, we can have a neat example. You need a special probe. It's very rare. Not every institution has that. Typically, we're talking about a liquid solution, and uh, we need to be using deuterated solvents. Why? Because a proton will drown out the other protons in your sample. Okay, so can you think of a deuterated solvent? You know, would you use methanol? Would you use chloroform? No, you would have to replace every hydrogen in there with a the deuterium because the deuterium would not show. Um, so the sample is then placed in a magnetic field and the tube is spun at a high rate to average magnetic field variations or tube imperfections. Um, when we do this with humans in MRIs, uh, we can't spin the human like that. And so there are different principles that are applied. But that's just some uh, background uh, for you. The most common... Um, NMR solvent is actually CD Cl3. So Cl3. Come on, work with me. CD Cl3. So that's a three. CD Cl3. So that's chloroform where the hydrogen has been replaced with deuterium. On the next slide, we now see the setup. So these are big magnets. Uh, you have to be careful. So here you have your CDCL3. Uh, usually it's at room temperature, although we can also do variable uh, temperature NMR um, before uh, the analysis. So again, usually we have a liquid. We use a deuterated solvent. And it's a small kind of tube. They're quite expensive. Uh, and they're going to be inserted up here. Uh, it's going to be lowered into the magnet. So this is all of the magnet. Um, and then it's being spun and you can collect the samples. Okay, so, um, and I have a funny story to tell. When I was still a postdoc at Case Western Reserve University, Custodial came in and wanted to vacuum a small piece of rug. Well, this is a powerful magnet. It was sucked into the magnet and it quenched the magnet, and which is troublesome. It can be, it's, it has to be restarted, um, but, you know, that's some other technology that we're not concerned about with here right now. Anyway, this was a big surprise to the custodial, but it could be fixed. So that's why you should not wear any metal, any other things. People who have 
uh, implants have to be careful um, so just a side note here so the characteristics of a proton uh, NMR spectrum um, you know we need to look at the number of signals and we are looking at non-equivalent hydrogens as well as carbons when we get to carbon 13. The location is really important. The location is expressed with chemical shift. And so here we use delta. Um, the signal intensity, which is the area under the signal, can tell us something about the different types of uh, protons we have and the ratio of them in here. Okay. Um, and then we need to look at the shape of, um, of the signal uh, or the splitting pattern. So when I look at this, this looks to me like there are three resonances. So one, two, three. So we don't count every line. We actually see patterns here. This would be a triplet, a quartet, and here we have a multiplet, probably something aromatic. So we're going to have to talk about splitting patterns that influence the shape in the spectrum. Okay, number of signals. Uh, remember that I had given you a um, that I had given you uh, a handout for in lecture. So a lot of information is in here too. So you can work through this. I gave you vocabulary. We looked at a couple of examples. So I now introduced on the lecture slides these. It's helpful to work through these. We can do this both for proton as well as for carbon-13. You know, practicing here as well. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the other topics that are on here. Topicity, integrals, chemical shift. Uh, these are, these are um, uh, figures that I drew with my professional software called ChemDraw. Uh, examples about multiplicity so you have plenty of things to work through in addition to all the all the great things that are in your book uh, and again you should start out with reading and taking copious notes um, and the ability to write is really important for success in organic chemistry uh, and I will I will post a filled in sheet with some notes and then at the end here we have something about depth and NMR. All right, going back to our presentation. So when we look at this, we have to be really, um, we have to understand the what is, what is a non-equivalent hydrogen uh, that that we see, and you know we want to be aware of whether. Imagine you are hydrogen here. You know, would this hydrogen be equivalent to the hydrogen over here? Um, and, you know, we could say, well, uh, there's only one carbon-hydrogen bond here, one carbon-hydrogen bond here, but this hydrogen is further away from this chlorine. And this hydrogen is, is closer to the chlorine, it's connected to the same carbon. And then we also have a CH3 group here. Um, so just by definition, because this is a methyl group, um, they're going to be all equivalent in there, but again, this is going to give you a different signal, right? So we want to think, if I'm in the spot, what does my electronic environment look like? So this hydrogen is trans from here on a different carbon. This hydrogen is on the opposite side connected to the same. We want to look for symmetry, right? So we have symmetry here, uh, you know, here, here. Uh, we can even draw symmetry here. You know, there are many, many possibilities. And in this case, and I'm going to say something about aromatic compounds, we have symmetry here and here. So that's going to affect the number of non-equivalent hydrogens that you're going to see in your, in your NMR. Okay, uh, moving on. So in the segment uh, uh, here, make sure you, you mention this for reference in your notes so you can go back to the textbook in case you've forgotten stuff, but you might still need that skill for the next, for the next, um, uh, or the upcoming chapters, but also remember we have a cumulative final exam at the end of the semester. So we, we're looking for different kinds of protons. They have a different electronic environment. Um, so protons that uh, are chemically equivalent um, are going to be identical. We cannot differentiate them. And those protons typically come, uh, they are either homotopic or enantiotopic. We cannot tell them apart in proton NMR. Okay, uh, so how do we define homotopic protons? Again, focus on working on skill builder, 
uh, segments so you can work through this. But here's a hint. If the molecule has an axis of rotational symmetry, uh, so usually that's C, uh, and typically C2 would be, uh, you divide 360 by 2, that gives you 180. So if you flip a molecule by 180 and you get the same structure, that's a good hint that you have a homotopic proton here. And here's some examples you should be working through. You could pause at this point, you can pause at any time this video, and write notes or look up some material in your textbook to work through this. So, um, number of signals. Um, now, I like to do the replacement test, uh, which tells us about topicity. And this is a, a drawing here that you have in a textbook, so I annotated this with some additional information. Uh, as I mentioned in the lecture, we're talking about a relationship. So we're always comparing maybe two protons or two methyl groups. It's a relational, relational interaction. Uh, we can also see it drawn as, well, here's HA and HB. And one question would be, what is the relationship between HA and HB? Are they identical? You know, so are they, are they homotopic, enantiotopic, or diastereotopic? So you do the replacement test. First, you replace one hydrogen, and then you can plug in a deuterium or another placeholder, a Z or something like that. Uh, but this book uses deuterium. So if I have a structure like this, which you might encounter in some of your assessment tools, if I replace this one, H, A to D, you get the structure. If you replace H, B, you get the structure. And guess what? I can simply flip this upside down, rotate this actually over, and then I see, um, flip this actually over, and then I can see that they're identical. You also may want to resort to uh, models. They can be very helpful because we're only dealing with a two-dimensional canvas here um, and uh, talking about three-dimensional aspects of organic chemistry. Okay, on the next slide, um, so we're still in section 15.4, so really practice, practice, practice. And you know, it's not that there is the saying, practice makes perfect. I'm not asking for perfection, but you need to practice because you can get an A when you get more than 90% of all available points. Okay, but please use all the tools that we have embedded in in this uh, textbook as well as in the D2L platform. Um, so topicity, homotopic, enantiotopic, or diastereotopic. Only diastereotopic uh, protons will have different signals. These two we cannot differentiate. So we just saw this example, and you can read through this. If the structures are identical, you may have to rotate it, build the models, overlap them, see whether they're identical or whether they you know, uh, have another stereochemical relationship. So that's why I said you know, it's really helpful to integrate the models in here. Uh, you see another example. Uh, so it's really universal, a very powerful test. Just do a couple of examples and you'll, you'll get the hang of it. Um, if we have this structure here and do the replacement test, first we replace this hydrogen and make it a deuterium. Then we replace this hydrogen and make it a deuterium. Now what is the relationship? They now behave like image and mirror image. Yeah. Uh, remember, image and mirror image means we have like a symmetry, we have a reflection line here. And every point, you know, from the right to the left, that's in the right spot. Yep, this looks like mirror image. And remember, this is just drawn like this, but they're really more in one line. We're just showing this a little bit differently. Build a model, and then you can see it. So we get enantiomers, image and mirror image. Protons are enantiotopic. They will have the same signal in the NMR. Again, build models. So, we just did this. Here's another example. You want to look for symmetry. This is also sometimes called rotational symmetry. I just mentioned C2 symmetry, so we rotate by 180 degrees, or reflective symmetry. Uh, and there's a flow chart that you can look on in figure 15.7. All right, in the same segment, 15.4, uh, we're now talking about uh, a different kind of replacement test. This is a little bit more challenging, but you have this in your textbook, work through it. Build the model. Uh, we replace this, we get a deuterium here. We replace this, we get the deuterium on the other side. If I now think of this, does this behave like image and mirror image? Yes, it does. Um, now, this is a, a Fisher projection. Anyway, let's just say we understand that they are diastereomers. 
So they're diastereotopic, they're not chemically equivalent, they're gonna have different signals in the NMR. Build the models to understand this, review Fisher projections. So actually uh, check the index, there are two sections. There's 2.7 and then there's more extensive section in 5.7. You will be well served to review this because guess what? When we talk about um, carbohydrates, you're gonna have to do a lot of things with Fisher projections. And you know, always take advantage of practicing with skill builder units in here. Here are different drawing methods. This is the Fisher projection. It's a simplification. What it really stands for, if we're looking at a stereo view or a 3D bond line structure, the horizontal lines come towards you. The vertical lines are pointing away from the observer. Okay, And there's a carbon here and here. So I've drawn some extra structures for you to understand this. But build the models to see that and convince yourself uh, as to what is going on. Um, in the next slide, um, so there are some shortcuts that I talked about here. Um, the two protons on a CH2 group will be equivalent if there are no chirality centers in the molecule. And uh, I inserted here, remember chirality centers, stereochemistry, you may want to go back to that chapter in Orgo 1. It's a carbon with four different substituents, right, in a, tet in a tetrahedral unit. Um, the two protons of CH2 group will not be equivalent if there is a chirality center. Okay, so we see here uh, there is no chirality center here. Again, we also want to recognize that there is symmetry that goes through here. So they are chemically equivalent. You will not be able to differentiate them. They're going to show up as the same signal in the NMR. Now, your chirality center, uh, the substituent with four, the carbon with four, four different substituents, well, that's a really different situation. Oops, I'm a little bit scraggly here, but here, yeah, that's a carbon with four different substituents. Uh, the hydrogen is not shown, but um, it, that is the chirality center. So that's why if you now replace, you're getting diastereomers in here, and so they are not chemically equivalent. Make sure you practice this. So 15.4, that, that section has a lot of very important uh, information. Uh, other Shortcuts, the three protons on any methyl group are always going to be equivalent uh, to each other. Um, so that would mean at the ends here, multiple protons are equivalent if they can be interchanged through either a rotation or a mirror plane. So this is what I refer to as sigma, right? And when I look at the structure here, I can say that, you know, here's the plane of symmetry. Uh, I could also simplify it and say, let me see whether this works well on my on my tablet. So I have an ethyl group, and then here you have your carbonyl group, and then you have another ethyl group, right? So there are different ways of drawing this. And remember that there's rotation about here, so but we do see the symmetry. Okay, we're still not done with section 15.4. Um, now, I had mentioned in lecture already that uh, when we're dealing with cyclohexanes, so remember there are axial and equatorial positions. These are the vertical lines um, and then the ones that point towards the equator. This is also going to be a very important uh, tool when we get to carbohydrates. Um, you had learned to do a ring flip uh, where this is going up, down, up. Now it is down, up, down where Axial becomes equatorial, equatorial becomes axial. Um, they do have technically different environmental electronic con um, environments. Um, and if we were to lower the temperature, uh, we could actually freeze them out. But that's a very specialized area. Technically, there are two types there, but only one signal is observed because they rapidly interchange. Unless I freeze, we freeze out one conformation over another by lowering the temperature. That's a very specialized aspect. Um, the NMR is not fast enough to see the individual structures, so we see usually one signal at room temperature. And then I had said, consider it flat. Don't draw it like this, convert it to a flat structure, which I've drawn here. And then we can see that, yeah, there is symmetry, and that's how we're gonna best analyze how many um, different signals we have. 
Okay, um, for um, the next part, so now we're moving on to segment 15.5. This is most theoretical background, you can read through this. Um, there is one reference that we often use when we make a solution, that reference is also called an internal standard. Uh, here is your TMS. Um, the silo group, this is very shielded. Uh, so this is set to uh, uh, zero. Everything is set in relationship to TMS, which shows up at zero ppm. So that's your chemical shift, ppm. Uh, so whatever the TMS uh, is, you know, we're going to um, refer this and then we also can measure this in Hertz. Um, the Hertz of the signal is different in different instruments, but the shift relative to TMS is constant, which means it's always going to be at zero, right? So TMS is defined as zero. And we know that the chemical shift as delta, right, uh, is given as parts per million. Moving on, let's look at some spectra. So current NMR analyses, um, you, have, um, you have a constant field of strength over a range of energies. Uh, here's some very important uh, terminology. Low field strength is downfield, and it's at higher numbers. So that's where that is. That's where we, we would have aromatic compounds, uh, which I'm going to abbreviate here as AR. They're typically around 7, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, TMS, here's your 0. okay, uh, And that's actually at high field. So this is your, your up field or high field. And then what we the terms we use is shielded and de-shielded. Yeah, so you need to understand that high field, which has lower numbers, is going to be, those are your shielded protons versus lower field is going to have the higher numbers to the left, and those are the ones that are de-shielded. And aromatics are especially de-shielded, and you'll have some graphics coming up in a few slides. Also in segment 15.5, jot it down in your notes, alkane protons generally give signals around 1 to 2 ppm. Um, and here is a comparison. So they can be shifted downfield, which means to the left, when nearby electronegative atoms cause de-shielding. Okay? So if I compare methane with now iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, fluorine being the most electronegative, guess what? I'm going up in numbers, so this is going to be most de-shielded. Uh, also, if we change the numbers, remember here we have, uh, we're now uh, using chloromethane or methyl chloride. Uh, if I have two, that's going to have a significant effect. See how the numbers become bigger. But also remember, this is going to be shifting to the left-hand side down field. And then if I have three, so here's your chloroform, that's at 7.3. Okay. And often when we use CdCl3, we can get traces, trace amounts of chloroform in there, so we know it's actually at 7.26. Also note that we can calculate, uh, there are lots of tables where you can look this up. So, the protons that are on the alpha carbon, here we have the alpha, beta, and gamma carbon, uh, they're going to feel the effect of the chlorine the strongest, and that's why this has the highest number, compared to this methyl group that is 1, 2, on the third carbon from your halide, it's going to be at 0.9 because with distance the electronegativity effect is going to wane. On the next, next slide, also about chemical shift, um, here we have um, two graphics um, to predict the chemical shift and again we can use calculations but I want you to have more a quantitative, have a quantitative, I'm sorry, have a qualitative understanding of the trends first. And yes, we can use tables to then calculate other things, but it's the qualitative that I really want to stress. Um, so this graphic here is from your textbook, where you see if, I, if we have a methyl, methylene, or methane, 
we're seeing a trend from 0 0.9, 1.2, 1.7. So it's actually going from right to left. Uh, so it's just, I wish this was uh, shown differently because we always have TMS and zero here for shielded, right? So upfield shielded, downfield shielded. Um, here we have strong electron withdrawing effect. Remember, we can draw a resonance here. We can draw a curved arrow on resonance, and we can place in the resonance structure a positive charge here, a negative charge here, which makes this very de-shielded. Aromatics are typically around 7 and a little bit higher. Uh, and then I have listed, I have lumped up basically all of these in this segment here. So we can go anywhere from 0.9 to 1.7. This is what I drew with my uh, Chemdra software. So use table 16.1. Um, and depending on proximity, we're going to also have a certain effect on what's going to happen in there. Next, chemical shift. Um, there are lots of tables, handbooks, um, a lot of different websites um, where you can uh, use to understand how the functional groups, how they affect um, the chemical shift, delta. Um, you know, here if we have the methyl group is actually one carbon away from the carbonyl group, which is an electron withdrawing group. These are much closer. And so we know that this is going to be more upfield and this is going to have a shift to the left. Uh, it's going to be less shielded. Okay. And we're going to learn more about this once we get into carbonyl compounds. And I really want to stress, make sure this is not about road memorization. Use your skill builder segments everywhere to get a better understanding. On the next slide, we're still in section 15.5, uh, when the electrons in a pi system are subjected to an external magnetic field, they circulate and produce a magnetic field, causing a diamagnetic uh, N isotropy. So this uh, diamagnetic um, uh, effect here, um, basically what it shows is you have to remember that this is flat right so here's your flat structure and these hydrogens are going to point to the middle of this and because uh, the induced magnetic field from the electrons I'm going to use a different color here remember that the electrons are zooming around in a circle creating an additional field and so the regions outside um, the ring have increased magnetic field and that's why they're being downfield around between 7 and 8 ppm. The next slide shows uh, an example. So this is ethyl benzene. So this anisotropic effect um, has is basically similar to de-shielding. So it has an electron withdrawing effect. Uh, so these that are uh, in this position are going to be downfield and here you are around 7 to 8. So that's why you want to, uh, uh, you know, if I always look at 7, do I have anything? You're going to have um, an aromatics, some aromatic protons. Uh, and then also, I didn't include in the slide deck, look at 14 annuline because sometimes really the physical arrangement of the structure within is what's going to give you uh, an inkling as to whether something is going to be upfield, right, which is here, uh, or downfield, which is to the left with the larger numbers. A couple more slides. Let's see, one more slide in this segment. So, for chemical shift, here's table 15.2. Uh, get an idea as to what makes this more upfield and what makes this more downfield, right? Um, you also want to understand there's some special um, information about how, uh, again, the field in these two pi bonds in the triple bond are going to affect this, similarly to what we just saw for an aromatic group, right? So, um, so even though this is a carbon-hydrogen bond in a triple bond, it's it's shifted to the left with respect to, let's say, a methane here. So we see a difference. So you want to look at these. I had mentioned here we have, you know, resonance that makes this 
can place a positive charge here. Aldehydes show up in a very original region. So that's a really good telltale sign you're dealing with an aldehyde group here. Uh, and then also vinyl, that is also between 4.5, 6.5. So you want to get a good feel for that. And then again, practice, practice, practice to get a, a good understanding for this. And we're going to take a little break here uh, before we move on to part two.